Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. I'm your co-host, Lolita, also joined by Kyle. Today's interview will be great as we have special guest Neil Bawa here with us today. Neil, thanks so much for being on our show. How are you? Fantastic. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. I'm very excited to be here. Happy to have you. All right. Well, before we get into the interview, here's a little bit about Neil. Neil is the CEO and founder of Grow Capitus and Multifamily U. Neil leads the company and then is the driving the syndication and acquisition of multifamily properties. Neil is an expert at what he does and speaks at numerous events across the country. Over 3,000 students attend his multifamily seminar series each year, and he is also the co-founder of the largest multifamily investment meetup in the U.S. BAMF over, with over 4,000 members. We have had the amazing privilege to have him speak at our multifamily master's Long Beach meetup twice this year already. So to have you come on our show, on our show today, Neil, is a privilege. So let's go ahead and get started. Neil, could you please tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you currently do? Sure. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am a geek. I am a nerd, a technologist <laughs> that uh, sort of fell into real estate through my day job. Um, my day job required me to build campuses. So in 2003, with my uh, CEO's guidance and help, I built a 27,000 square foot campus pretty much from scratch. So it was one of those soup to nuts projects. And then two years later, our business was growing. So I had a chance to build a second one. And those two projects, which were so jumbo in size, uh, being my first projects, uh, really grounded me in real estate and, 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 and helped me understand the different facets of real estate. So you, one could easily say that I started in real estate in reverse, right? So mm -hmm. I actually went to single family homes after my first $10 million in, in real estate. Wow. Perfect. So today we're going to talk about a whole new way to evaluate a real estate opportunity, which is by using data. And that's how you in invest. So from a high level, how are you using data to make better decisions on your real estate investments? Well, to me, um, data is everything. One of the things that I like to tell people, and maybe you want to write this down, is that data is the oil of the 21st century, right? So if you lived in 50 years ago in Texas, you couldn't, almost couldn't help but be rich because there was oil everywhere, right? And then you basically went out and bought a large piece of land. Sooner or later, you would hit oil, you know, hit oil and, and be very rich. The same thing, the exact same thing happens with the use of data and analytics. And everybody, everybody that I talk to says, I'm data driven, right? And people are like, yeah, you know, I, I, I love your data, you know, processes. I love what you're talking about. That's exactly how I'm set up. And I'd like to challenge that because I think that we are all surface level data driven, right? We're all people that like to say that we're data driven, but we're really not as data driven as we, we should be. And I think success is just one step above where most people are in terms of being data driven. And that's, that's what I'm gonna tell you about today. I'm gonna to challenge you a little bit to go up that one or two extra steps so you can truly be data driven. And when you're truly data driven, you have to make some immense sacrifices. For example, if I've been saying really, really great things about a Metro and the data doesn't support it, it now becomes part of my job to stop saying that or to say things like, well, Columbus is actually now slowing down. It's been a great Metro for the last three or four years. And so I'm not looking there anymore. I'm, I'm gonna to go to some other place. And it takes a lot of courage to say that because you probably built a lot of you know, relationships in Columbus at, by this, at this time. And to walk away from that requires a lot of courage. So data is not just about application of numbers. Data is about living by what those numbers say and being courageous enough to walk away from perfectly good deals when the data says that they're okay and not great, or they're good and not great, and you're looking for great deals. So when I'm looking at data for real estate, I have a set of metrics, and I'm gonna give you those sets of metrics today, and you can basically learn how, you know, uh, how I apply these metrics. And then I also look at overall health of Metro. So I gather information. For example, my favorite city in the US to invest in, depending upon which day of the week it is, is either St. George, Utah or Provo, Utah, right? So those are, those are the two that I love the most. And Provo just won the, uh, it, it, this, is, this is in 2019, the 2018 award for best performing city in the United States. So best performing city. So I look at that sort of data, it's subjective data that, that feeds back into my objective data. But the objective data that I look at is really five 
different metrics at a city level and then five metrics at a neighborhood level. And today we'll have a chance to talk about the city level. So the number met one metric that matters is population growth, right? When you go into places that are losing population like Detroit, what you're doing is you're sitting in an airplane that has headwinds, right? So if you're sitting in a plane and it's going 550 miles an hour, and you have 200 miles of headwind, guess what? Your plane is actually only going at 350, not 550, right? And if, the, if, the, if you turn that plane around, you turn around 180 degrees and went the other direction, now you have a 200 mile tailwind. So now your plane is not flying at 550, it's flying at 750 all of a sudden, even though it's all flying at the exact same speed. When I say speed, try to correlate that to the same price homes, the same tenant base, the same, you know, same everything else but your demographic data is pushing you faster or slower depending upon where you're buying. And the first piece of those, those demographics is population. And the rule that I like to apply for population is that there's a website called city-data.com. Now, actually, before I go to city-data, we'll just talk about Google. To pull population data for any city in the US, all you have to do is type in population space, you know, Columbus, Ohio, or whatever the city is, and hit enter, and Google will give you a very nice colored graphic, right? So it'll, it'll have a line that's going up or going down. Hopefully the line's going up because that shows that the population is increasing. And what you wanna do is you wanna take a look at the latest number, which Google shows right there on the page. And then you wanna mouse back a little bit so that you can get to the 2000 number. So those two numbers, take those numbers and figure out the difference between them. You want the, the difference between 2000 and the current year to be about 20%. It's a good rule of thumb. And if you're going into cities that are above that 20%, you're likely to do really, really well because the population growth is driving up a demand for jobs, demand for, uh, for homes, and also incomes. So you're gonna do really, really well on all of those metrics if the population growth is there. So some of the cities that have been growing very fast are uh, Phoenix or Orlando, um, cities uh, like St. George, Provo. These are cities that have extremely fast growth. And then you have cities that are doing okay. They're not doing poorly but they're not growing. Cincinnati is a city that comes to mind. So is Pittsburgh. These are cities that have lost population, but they've lost very little population, so they're doing okay. And then there are cities that have had very massive losses in population. Detroit, Dayton, Ohio are cities that come to mind, are, are, are places that there's been a massive amount of population loss. And I can tell you that in my mind, the population loss in Detroit is more than a 200 mile headwind. In my mind, that plane may not be going forward at all because it's going at 500 miles an hour with a 500 mile an hour headwind. It's really, really difficult to make money there. People are making money there. I'm not saying that people, nobody makes money in Detroit, but the percentage of people losing money is much higher than the percentage of people making money. So you have to be careful in those sorts of places. So population growth is really, Kyle, my first metric when it comes to you know, looking at the numbers. Okay, perfect. Well, I love this episode because you're just going to go through all your focuses and I'm going to have to talk less. So that's awesome. So can we go through your other four uh, city real focuses? Certainly. So the, the, the second real focus is simply um, the, uh, the income growth, right? So you're looking for there to be a certain amount of income growth in any particular city. And um, getting that information is really easy. You go to city-data.com and you plug in the name of the city, so it could be Phoenix, um, you know, uh, Arizona, and then you scroll down maybe about six inches or so, and you'll come across median household income. You're looking at median household income, and what you and once again, you'll see two numbers. You're gonna see a number now. It's, it's a few years old, but it doesn't matter. Just pick up that number, and then next to it, you'll see a number of where that no income level was in the year 2000. The difference between those two numbers and you know, a little bit of Excel work needed here should be about 30%. So population growth, 20%. And now you're looking for income, you know, that should be about 30%. And why in 30%? Because that population growth is driving up the incomes beyond inflation. Every city, even the ones losing population, will typically see an increase in income. There's gonna be some because of, you know, because of uh, inflation, right? but you're now going faster than inflation because that population is pushing up your, your income levels. So 30% is that second number that you should be looking at. And then the third number that you should be looking at is tied to that, and that is home price growth. So on the same city data page, 
roughly an inch below where it says median household income, you actually have median house or condo value. Take a look at that. Once again, you'll see two numbers. You'll see the 2000 number. You'll see the most recent number. Basically figure out the difference between them. Now this time, it's not 20%, it's not 30%, it's 40%. You wanna basically hit an area that has a 40% growth in its home or con values in that same time frame, right? 20 leads to 30, 30 leads to 40. So you're now getting what is known as the all ships rising effect. This is one of the most powerful things in real estate. I tell people it's like cheating, right? And people are like, what do you mean it's like cheating? Basically what I tell them is, if I was investing in Shreveport, Louisiana, right? This is one of the worst markets in the country in my, in my book, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'm no expert, but in my, when I do the math, Shreveport, Louisiana looks really bad. And then I compare that to something like St. George. And the numbers for St. George might be five or 10 times higher, all of these numbers that I just mentioned. To me, that's almost like cheating. And it only took me like an hour or two hours to figure out that St. George has one of the highest population growth and job growth and income growth uh, in the United States. It wasn't very difficult to figure those things out. And then look at Louisiana. So given that it only took me an hour to become this instant expert at, at real estate, it's almost like cheating because you're going to end up making many times more money in Provo, Utah, or St. George, Utah, or some of the cities in Florida that are doing really well, beginning to get a little bubbly now, by the way. Um, and, and, and that's why I think in an odd sort of way, it is like cheating, but you're not doing anything wrong. You're using numbers, you're using that, you know, data that's acceptable to anybody else. And essentially you, you can look like a rock star, even though you're really not, you're, you're just somebody that has been patient enough to, to use numbers and to really accept what they say and walk away from opportunities when they don't match what these numbers are saying. So that's, that's my number three, metric, right? So uh, home price growth, 40% or greater. And a lot of the cities that I just mentioned would crush these numbers. So Orlando, Phoenix, you know, St. George, um, Dalton, uh, Georgia, not Dalton, Ohio, Dalton, Georgia um, would crush these numbers. So would Atlanta, so would uh, Jacksonville, uh, Tucson. These are cities that would really easily beat these numbers. Uh, some cities are crazy. Uh, Orlando and Phoenix have had over 100% growth in home prices, not 40, but over 100%, right? So some of the city cities are way past this number. Beyond that, the number four, this, the fourth number that we look for is still on that city data page, but now you've got to scroll down a little bit. You've got to scroll down several feet before you hit this blue table, and that blue table says crime rates, right? And it's a massive table and it's got, you know, lines for like rapes and robberies and burglaries and all those sorts of things. You have to ignore all of those and go to the last line. In the last line, to the, there, you're looking at the leftmost number and the rightmost number. As you can imagine, the rightmost is the current year or the newest year. And then the leftmost number is about 15, 16 years ago. So you're comparing those two numbers, but you're making sure that the rightmost number, the most, most current number, is at least 500 or below. You wanna be below 500 in crime. Right? You might say, what does that mean, uh, Neil? Does that mean there's 500 murders in that city in a year? And the answer is no, it, it, this is an aggregate number. It's, it's almost like a metric that they've created by looking at all the different crime and aggregating and coming up with some sort of formula. It's called the city data index. So it's, it's an index. And you want the city that you're investing in to be below 500, but there's something else that you want. You want the number on the left to be a lot higher than the number on the right. Because what that shows is crime was higher before and has been declining over time. And because crime has been declining over the last 15 years, there's a good chance it'll keep declining. And the more the decline in crime, the lower the cap rates, which means the higher the prices, whether it's single family or multifamily. So you'll, you'll get this, again, this all ships rising effect if you're in a city where crime is steadily declining and has been for at least a decade, hopefully for even longer than that. And so look for 500 and below, and then also look for uh, there to be a decline. So Orlando, one of my favorite cities to invest is not quite at 500, it's at about 550. But what I like is that it was at 850, not you know in, in 2002 and 2003. So it's really come a very, very long way and has a very consistent track record of decline. Columbus, Ohio used to be at about 750 and now it's at, at 414. So it's crossed that 500 level, even though it's a Rust Belt city and used to be a high crime city. Um, Boise, Idaho is the best in the US at 214. So those are amazing numbers. 
Um, Phoenix is somewhere in the middle, right around 500, but it certainly has dropped a great deal in crime over the last 15 years. So you're looking for those sorts of cities. And, and once again, what you're trying to do is to game the system so that when you leave five or 10 years later, crime will be a lot lower and you're going to get compensated from that by the buyer. And people are like, well, prices can't go any lower in Phoenix or, or Orlando. Really? Why can't they go any lower? The you know, San Francisco Bay Area has prices that are three times higher, not 30% higher, 3x higher right? Why would, is there something magical about the San Francisco Bay Area that prices no, anywhere else can't really match us? That's, that's never going to happen, right? You look at Austin, it's been on that technology journey for the last 10 or 15 years, and its prices don't re even resemble the rest of Texas. But as cities change, and it takes a long time for them to change, 10 years or 15 years, the, the benchmarks of pricing just simply changes. You look at Salt Lake City, it's already four and a half cap market, right? Whereas Provo might be more like five and a half caps, St. George might be more than more like six and a half caps. So cities have changed over time. Say, 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 you know, Salt Lake City didn't look like this in terms of cap rates five or 10 years ago, but, but as institutional money flooded into the market, the market changed, it changed. And so you can game the system if you know which way the city is going. The last metric that I, I love to talk about, Kyle, and it, this is to me really one of the most important metrics is, is job, jobs. Unfortunately, you cannot get job data from city-data.com, at least not accurate data. Job data is actually provided very current in the current in the in the US because of social security checks having to be cut each month. So you can really get job data for two months ago. And the URL is a little bit complicated. So maybe you guys can type that into um, the chat here for the people that are listening. It's departmentofnumbers.com. That's D-E-P-T of numbers.com slash employment slash metros. So what you're trying to do is that you are trying to go to this, you, you basically go to this page slash employment slash metros and you're gonna see a list of every metro in the US, all of them, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And the last column to the right shows you basically the unemployment rate, right? And you click that rate, I'm sorry, uh, the, the job growth rate, sorry, not the unemployment rate, the job growth rate, growth over the last 12 months. And you're gonna sort that. And then you're gonna start seeing some amazing cities at the top of this list. Obviously the bottom of this list is horrible. Those are cities that even today with, you know, eight or nine years of continuous growth, we've, we've created 20 million jobs in this country. These are places still losing population, uh, you know, with practically perfect unemployment rates or employment rates. Well, I know what's gonna to happen to these places as soon as we get into a recession, they're going to turn into disaster zones. So stay very, very far away from anything in the bottom 25% of this list. The top. 25% of the list is very challenging also. And that's because a lot of these are low cap places, but a lot of these are places you've never heard of. So uh, the top of the list right now at slightly over 5% year over year job growth is Reno, Nevada. Most of those are industrial jobs because it's an industrial center, Tesla's there, but, but there's a lot of opportunity there. So I don't particularly like Reno as much, even though it stays at the top of the list because it's so focused on industrial, which I feel is a very fickle market can turn on a dime. Um, St. George is at uh, right next to, uh, to uh, 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 Reno and, and it's at 4.87. And what I like is St. George has basically two or three main legs. There's education, there's healthcare, and there's tourism, right? So it's, it's it, economy is not dependent on one of these three. It's dependent on three of them. Uh, it also happens to be part of a state that's doing really well. There's also a city from New Jersey that shows up there. But as a state, New Jersey is doing really poorly. So I like the fact that, you know, St. George is in a state that also is ranked very highly top three in the US. So when you're looking at these cities, the last thing that you should be doing, guys, is look at this list once. Because every once in a while, some, some um, major manufacturer is going to go open a location in one of these cities and all of a sudden there's 500 brand new jobs that come in, right? And so the city sort of spikes, you know, for a month or two months or three months and then basically goes down to you know, being sleepy town. And so what you wanna do is you actually wanna look at that page, and I usually have my staff copy it into Excel and put it into an Excel tab. We, we look at it every month, and we wanna look at it every three months, and usually I just look at the top like 20 or 30 cities, because that's what, what my focus is. I wanna invest in the, the places that have the fastest job growth in the US. So I look at them every single month, and I'm like, okay, what's the pattern here, right? So I see Provo, I see St. George, I see Atlanta, Phoenix, Orlando, 
are very consistent in that top list. And then there are cities that just go sort of up and down and you'll see them, Kennewick, Washington comes in often, Dalton, Georgia comes in often. So those are other places that are interesting. Jacksonville often shows up, but it's not very consistent, right? So I'm looking for a lot of consistency in that job growth list. And there's nothing that you're going to find that tells you more about where America is headed than this page. Such a simple page. It's just a list but the amount of money that you're going to create for your investors by just bookmarking this and going to it every single month, just put a, a reminder on your calendar. You've gone from being just a regular Joe investor to being an elite investor. That's, I mean, that's how much of a difference all this stuff makes, right? I pay for expensive tools like Neighborhood Scout and Housing Alerts and Local Market Monitor and CoStar but I still find this one list to be the easiest to give me a sense of what's happening in the US. It's especially important right now because I have to tell you this, after six or seven years of just everything goes up, that's not the case anymore. The single family market is, is uh, stuttering. Uh, we're starting to see no growth in home prices nationwide or maybe like just very anemic growth. There's markets where home prices are reducing. The San Francisco Bay Area be one of them. Los Angeles is flat, could, could also see a reduction. And so there's a lot of market. Miami, in my mind, is a, is a, is a uh, very dangerous market because of the massive number of uh, unpurchased condos that are available for sale. They have five years of condo inventory available for sale. So there's mm -hmm. going to be all kinds of bad things that will happen over the next year as if, if we hit some kind of economic roadblock or, or slower growth. So it's very important today to be careful. I find that the, sometimes people say, you know, multifamily is in a bubble. And I say, that's just total nonsense. There's no evidence of that. Here's evidence of something else that's in a bubble, multifamily syndication, right? A lot of syndicators basically getting together and trying to sell properties in, in places that are just horrible. Right. I know you guys are looking in Phoenix, so obviously that's one of the better markets out there, also, not just for the five year, but also for the 15 year. But I see people out there looking at really, really terrible markets and the fallout is going to affect all of us. So today is really a time to be careful and a time to basically say, look at every deal five times before you say yes. You know, in our case, we're saying no. I mean, we recently said no to a deal in, in Phoenix simply because it was it wasn't strong enough. We, 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 we feel like we want to have a lot of uh, room to screw up, a lot of room to make mistakes, right? So it, those things happen, right? So it's a podcast, so I can say, you know, these, these oh fuck moments when they happen, right? If you have, you know, enough of, of a room, you'll still make your investors what's supposed to have to, to um, uh, you know, what, what you're supposed to give them. So we're looking for that kind of room today because the market is sort of priced to perfection. We're all underwriting, assuming a whole bunch of uh, glowing things, uh, assuming that a lot of good things are going to happen. So it's really time to be you know, careful about the marketplace. That's, that's what I, I feel today in my gut. Yeah, awesome for that. Thank you for all that detail. Now, going back to the uh, Department of Numbers page, there are a couple of cities that show up at the top of that list that you probably should stay away from as well. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, so um, basically in Texas, there are cities like Odessa, Texas, and uh, there's another one, I can't remember what, what, what that one is, but there's these two cities that either are at the, at the very top of this list or at the very bottom. And they're at the very top of the list when the price of oil is about above 65 or $70 a barrel because these cities, almost 100% of their employment, the other one's Midland, Midland and Odessa, almost 100% of the employment are drillers right? And they're related to, to shale oil. And so what I tell people is the most dangerous places in America to invest for real estate are, are not places like Detroit or, or parts of Detroit. It's actually Midland, Texas and Odessa, Texas. If you don't understand oil, if you really don't get oil, those are the worst places to invest in. Yeah. Okay. And then going back to crime on the city data table, I just want to make sure anyone that's going to utilize this, you can see a drop off in crime in that city data, and it could actually be a little bit of a false uh, indicator. Can you talk about that as far as the two ways that a city can basically reduce their crime? Right. So I call it the Chicago method and the Columbus method. So uh, cities can effectively over, let's say, 
is short term or long term, they can try to reduce crime in two different ways. The, the better method takes about 15 years, 15 or 20 years. And that is that the city starts to make a major investment uh, into its universities and into its healthcare systems. So what they do is they start attracting healthcare and, and, and education jobs. And those jobs tend to be the most stable. They tend to have pensions connected to them. They tend to have you know, uh, job security. And so cities want those kinds of jobs. So Columbus, for example, spent a lot of time investing into Ohio State. They spent a lot of time uh, investing into its healthcare systems in, in the 90s. And they really didn't see a result back then. So the politicians that made that investment back then were all visionaries because they didn't get the benefit while they were in office, but they knew it was the right thing to do for their city. And so they made that investment instead of doing something very flashy. Then there are cities that have taken the approach of being very politically uh, connected to, um, to crime. So, well, you know, Chicago has been one of those cities where every time there's all this hoo-ha in the newspapers about there being too much crime in, uh, in um, Chicago, we, we, on an ongoing basis, we will start seeing a crime drive where basically their goal is to lock up, you know, 5,000 people from the South side. Yeah. And, and, and some of those are fairly petty crimes, but because these people have, you know, been in jail before now their terms are longer. So now you basically have somebody that did a minor theft and you stuck him in jail for three or four years and turned them into a hardened criminal. Now, when you do that, obviously you stuck 5,000 people in jail. Well, you're going to see a decline in crime. So the next year, you're going to see a big drop in the city data numbers. And you go, mm, well, this, this is nice. You know, Chicago is moving in the right direction. Well, none, no such thing is really happening, right? Because what's happening is two or three years later, the election is over. Whoever was elected as mayor because he locked up a bunch of people won. And now those people are coming back out. And when they're coming back out as hardened criminals, they're not doing petty crime. They might be getting involved in some very, very serious crime, which obviously counts more on the counts as a higher number on the index. Now, all of a sudden, you see the spike backwards. So now you see this ziggy zaggy sort of thing up and down, up and down. What that means is the city is trying to reduce crime through enforcement. And there's actually no historical evidence that you can reduce crime in the long run through enforcement. The only way to re reduce crime is jobs right? The, and, and employment and, and education. Cities that have very high levels of education also tend to have very low levels of crime. Provo is a, is a perfect example of a city. UVU and BYU, both of which are in Provo, have extremely high quality of graduates. And so the city's unemployment rate is at 2%. Therefore, its crime is almost zero, right? So when you look at the crime for the city, you go, do these people leave their doors open? Because they probably could, right? <laughs> and it's, it's okay to do that when you live in a place like that. So um, on, on the other hand, you look at South Chicago or you look at you know, parts of Oakland or parts of Memphis, and those are extraordinarily dangerous places. And that's what this study of numbers is showing you. Why is it that you're getting such a great deal in Memphis? Why is it that you're getting such a great deal in South Chicago? My advice to you is that you should walk away from those deals. There are no great deals today. And if one appears great, it's because you haven't figured out what's wrong with it. Yep. Great advice. Okay. So you've already given three different websites that are free tools that people can use. City data, department of numbers, Google. Are there any other free tools out there that people should use as far as data is concerned? Um, not free, but sort of free. So I'm going to give you some ideas, right? So one of my favorite tools is, um, is housingalerts.com. And it's about, it's about $1,000 a year. And it's run by Ken Wade, um, a, a Stanford grad, very, very smart guy. Now, what these guys do is they, to promote what they're doing, every once in a while, they, they record a video snippet of their analytic tool and they stick it on YouTube. So I want you to go to YouTube and find uh, housing alerts and subscribe to their channel. Now, one of the things that happens is when you walk through those videos, they, they do things like worst cities in, in America to invest in. There's a two minute or three minute video, right? And whenever you're watching the video, watch it on a monitor that has a very high resolution right? And so as they're going through the video, at some point, they'll show you a screenshot of, your, of, the, of their software. Well, then pause the video, click pause, and then take a full screenshot left to right of what they're showing you 
because on the screen right now are the worst ranked and the best ranked cities in the, U in the US. And not only can you see them, you can actually see why they're ranked best because the, the, there's columns and those columns are showing things like jobs and population growth and income growth, right? So the metrics, and they, they usually do a ranking of one to a hundred, right? So like Provo might be ranked in the high nineties and you know, Chicago I think has a very low rank, ranking right now. So, so what, what you're basically doing is without actually subscribing, you're getting access to some of their data. Obviously, the right thing to do in my mind is to subscribe to their data, right? A lot of people say, oh, but it's a thousand bucks. And I say something like this, are you looking to invest a hundred dollars in real estate? If that's the case, then thousand dollars is a lot. If you're looking to invest at least $10,000 in real estate, and most people are, right? Then a thousand dollars is very little because I'm talking about potentially you swinging your profit by 2X or 3X, right? And a thousand dollars is 10% of 10,000. If you're investing a hundred grand, then it's 1%. And if you're investing your investor's money, then it is your duty to be looking at this. It's your job, your duty to look at these paid tools and who knows, you might be able to bill them back to your investors in some projects, especially if you're you know, doing a market study or something like that. So it's super important to look at those kinds of tools. So housing alerts, their videos are on, on YouTube are definitely a good place to look at. Um, and then on my website, multifamilyu.com, um, there are, there you search for Ingo Windsor, I-N-G-O, just to search for the word I-N-G-O, and you'll see that Ingo Windsor, who is the CEO of localmarketmonitor.com, comes in every three or four months and does a webinar. And this guy sort of gives away his data in that webinar. I'm usually stunned. It's like, you know, by the end of the webinar, I'm kind of scratching my head going, so why do I want to really buy your product? And the answer is, well, you know, because you want to have the deep dive access into a particular zip code or particular neighborhood. But at a city level, the, the information that he gives away is quite stunning. Uh, and his products only is, is also about a thousand bucks. In my mind, is better than housing alerts. And um, what's nice is that he gives us a massive discount. So if you you know the the code that our uh, people use is called um, it's called multifamily U. So just you know you can approach them and say, hey, I'm a multifamily U student, and they'll give you a massive discount. Um, so that so that one might be a good one to try, but again, there's a cost associated with it. So now I'm going from you know free to almost free. But my message is clearly this: you, you really should be paying for data, because if you don't pay for data, you're going to pay for not paying for data. I hope you understand what that means. Yep, absolutely. Great. Lily is going to take us into our final four questions. Are you ready? All right, Neil. Here we go. Speaking of tools, what is the one tool that you use in real estate investing that you cannot do without? Neighborhood Scout. So we pulled about 300 reports in the last year. It is a paid tool, but it's extremely inexpensive. Um, we use the last page of the Neighborhood Scout report extensively, the blue chip versus the appreciation. And we look for places that are three slash three on those two levels or higher. So Provo, for example, is four on the future appreciation out of five and five, which is the highest score on the blue chip size side. So you basically can't get any better than that. I've never seen a five slash five, but that particular page is potentially the most powerful page of an analytics in the business. Perfect. Thanks for that. Can you tell us a story about your biggest mistake in real estate investing so far and what's the main takeaway for our listeners? I bought a 237 unit in South Chicago and everything that I've told you came out of the incredible pain that I've gone through, my partner has gone through, my investors have gone through. The property is now up for sale and investors will recover their money, but we didn't give them a dollar in cash flow over mm -hmm. almost four years. I mean, you cannot imagine, Lalita, the number of sleepless nights I've had where I've just stared at a ceiling for days or weeks on, you know, just not being able to get to sleep because I was afraid that I was going to lose investor money. Mm -hmm. And the, the good things that came out of it, two things. Number one, everything that I just told you came out of it because I researched and I said, I am not going to make this mistake again. And so my, my whole system came out of trying to understand what I did wrong in South Chicago. 
Um, the second piece of what I came out of it is, I realized that I needed to generate an extraordinarily large number of tenant leads because the tenant quality there was so awful that basically out of 100 people that were interested, we could only get two or three of them into our apartment complex. Otherwise, we would have this never ending cycle of delinquency. And so I created a massive team in the Philippines. It's up to about 16 people now. And that team generates about 30, 40,000 leads for our properties, which we are absolutely delighted to have because it's so much easier to lease up those properties with the team. So we, we, I took what was a four year torture process in Chicago and turned it into basically the two biggest advantages of my company, the data analytics and the army in the Philippines that optimizes our properties. Oh, that's great. You live and you learn. What is it that you need to do now to grow your life to the next level? Um, honestly, from a business perspective, I have everything that I want. I, the question I'm asking myself every day is, how do I make my life better? And a lot of those things have nothing to do with money. You know, um, My wife and I drive luxury cars, but they're not the most expensive luxury cars. They're, you know, they're, they're regular vehicles that most people drive. I live in a beautiful home. You're actually sitting in my, my, uh, you know, the, looking at my loft. And um, so to me, it's really about what more can I do, right? So a lot of it is related to charity. A lot of it is related to giving, giving back. Uh, but a lot of it is also related to how do I enrich my life, right? So I t- told people that um, the sort of things that I'm looking to do now with my life is figure out what truly enriches my life. For example, I'm, I'm you know, starting this year, I'm going to have a massage therapist every weekend so I can relax. And also as I get older, I'm 47. I can, he can work through all of the, the, the issues that my body is beginning to develop because I, I, I wrecked it back in the 20s with motorcycle accidents. So those things to me are a hundred times more powerful than you know, all these vision board things that you see, the jet, the, the mm-hmm. boat, the island. I really have no interest in any of those. I'm, I'm looking to figure out how to optimize my life. And I'm then looking to see how can I do it the same for my team members. What can I do to make their life better? Absolutely love that answer. Finally, Neil, uh, where can people find out more about you? Um, the best way to contact me, and I'm, I'm very visible to people. You can reach out to me on, fis, uh, on Facebook. I'm the only Neil Bawa, N-E-A-L Bawa on the internet. Um, and also feel free to reach out to me on multifamilyu.com. Um, another place, all of my research, what, what I gave you is roughly a quarter percent of um, my research. The rest of my research is in my Multifamily U toolkit and the toolkit is available for free. Anyone can have access to it. So two ways to get access to it. One is go to www.multifamilyu.com slash toolkit or uh, send a text message, uh, the word RE toolkit, no spaces, RE toolkit to 44222. Either way, that'll give you access to the, um, to the toolkit. I update it every quarter. And then we send an email to you every quarter saying, okay, here's all the, the latest stuff that we've added. Like the Millikan report that just came out ranking, you know, hundred cities in the U S is the next thing that we're going to add to the toolkit because the report just came out. Fantastic. Neil, you are amazing and you make it seem like investing is obvious and easier than it really is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I truly enjoy listening to you speak. So listeners, I highly encourage you attend an event that Neil is speaking at or to participate in his multifamily seminars and boot camps. You'll be absolutely stunned on the content he goes over. So Neil, as always, so great to see you and thanks so much for being on our show. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Lolita. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Have a Neil. wonderful day.